Welcome back to the Charismatic Voice. Today we're going to be making a return to Opeth, whom I first heard just a few months ago. They were fantastic. I loved the way that they evolved between different kinds of music. They're considered a progressive metal rock band, but they also have elements sometimes of folk music and jazz. And their lead singer, Michael, is really awesome. I loved the different kinds of styles he was able to bring before. So I'm excited to get to hear them again, performing Harlequin Forest. Now, this will be taken from their 2010 performance at Royal Albert Hall. And I did do a little bit of research on these lyrics ahead of time. They are complex. I really, really dig the lyrics in this. I feel like there's so many different ways you could go with interpretations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that while we listen. Let's get to it. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Five piece. <laughs> Shut up. But this song is called Harlequin Forest. This is uh, right away, immediately, there's a doubling in that vocal. It sounds like it's doubled an octave higher. Um, really, really interesting to me. I also am reminded by the cut of his just natural timbre. I think Michael's voice has no, um, no filter of trying to sound like someone else on top of it. It's just going straight and it feels like it's going straight to these resonators uh, that uh, and has no cover or extra tension somewhere. It's just really, truly his voice. Uh, and it's even done in a way that doesn't feel like it's uh, over supported. He's not trying to be something that he isn't. Uh, I think that's very interesting. Let's go back and listen to a bit and, and look for that doubling. Uh, in that instrumental break, of course, uh, this is in 4-4 four, four at this point. There's a steady 1, 2, 3, 4 going. But if you're looking at the subdivision of the eighth notes, you have this 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. And when you have that feeling, it feels almost like you're being cut off during that last two. And like it, it tumbles into the next part. Uh, and I think that this is an interesting take with the lyrics. Um, at this point, it sounds like somebody's being chased away into the trees past meadow grounds and further away from my home. Bang behind me, I hear the hounds, flocks chasing to find me alone. So this person is like outcasted, it sounds like, and is being chased essentially. Okay, uh, let's go back and catch that transition.
once again, just this extra buzz that he has, I, I think it really works. Um, the, he's singing in some lower pitches overall, but he's got great cut over the top. Like his voice is really coming through. And that's because essentially of what we sometimes refer to as twang, or I've said it as a laser or just focus or buzz before. So really, uh, his voice is actively resonating a bunch, like right through here, right in this forward mask part of his face. Um, and that buzzing, it's just sympathetic resonance of the pitch that's created by his vocal folds here. So they're busy going wacka, wacka, wacka and creating that fundamental pitch. And then when they come up here, they can essentially bounce off uh, that sound wave will bounce off of different areas inside of your vocal tract. And depending on how you formed here or various, uh, the vowel, like how you're shaping your tongue, all kinds of little tiny adjustments that a singer can make inside uh, will de determine if there is maybe more twang in the sound or maybe the sound becomes more diffuse, or uh, you can adjust to have more dome or loft. His voice right now has a lot of this twang of this more buzzy forward placement. I love how cleanly he's singing and then all of a sudden it sounds like a monster in the forest just jumped out, right? And I, the fog is a really cool effect on the stage too, I like that. Um, I was about to point out right before this really cool growl, false fold growl, I think, uh, he when he's singing in his upper register, it again reminds me of a jazz approach. It's not... It's not um, really heavily lined or belted. It feels like it's a little easier, right? A little bit more laid back, even though it's in the top and there is some belting going on. It's just more laid back. And that is often something you'll find a little bit more in jazz. So it's very interesting. Uh, let's go back and hear that transition into this really dope growl. <laughs> I I love the consistency of this growl. I don't know a ton about different kinds of growls, right? This isn't my specialty whatsoever. I think that most of you like recommending this because you like to see me have a little bit of a shock factor. Um, but I've been hearing more and more different kinds of growls and I just find it super fascinating. This one definitely sounds uh, loose and relaxed and open. Right. So I'm, I'm hearing some false fold involvement here and it doesn't sound like he's got like a lot of tension anywhere. Uh, and you actually hear some pretty clear words happening in here as well. Let's check that out again. Did he just say rar? <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, whoa. What an interesting shift in music here. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about these words because I think that this leans into the title, Harlequin Forest. So uh, Harlequin can have a few different definitions. And I was looking around and there's some people that like to think about it being related to an old usage of the term that has to do with demons and the fight of good and evil. It might be related to that. Um, but Harlequin, for me, brings up a very vivid image, essentially of a jester-like character. Uh, this is partly because there's a essentially a Harlequin in an opera at one point that's pretty famous. Um, so this character is often dressed in like diamond pattern, very brightly colored clothing, and uh, and it's a comic character, almost 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 tragically, or sometimes it's almost tragically comical, and the the character to me in this song it has moments where it's talking about jest and death and i feel like we're really referring to this comic character so at this point he was just talking about lose all to save a little at your peril it's justified and dismiss your demons as death becomes a jest you are the laughing stock of the absent minded confession stuck in your mouth and long gone fevers reappear I feel like there's so many layers in this, but in particular, this as death becomes a jest. Uh, I'm thinking about this person that's running uh, from a town or hounds that are chasing them uh, into this forest. And it's almost like the trees are laughing at his peril, or maybe the trees are individuals and people in, in his life. And he feels like he's running away from something, but the people are still laughing at him and he can't get out of that. Uh, and maybe he's calling them the absent minded because they're drunk, but the, the jester has to keep joking around. Uh, I think it's just a very interesting and almost twisted reality that this person is living in that has so many different layers. And the idea of a Harlequin, this jester in here to me makes so much sense and wondering, you know, what does that jester feel like? What do they live for? What is when they're tormented by someone, who did they go to for relief? I was really, I think that it's a fascinating uh, idea to think about. And I think uh, a lot about what that forest represents. Anyhow, if you guys haven't looked at the lyrics of this song and looked at them in depth, you totally should. And please share with me your interpretations in those comments below. Let's keep going here. <laughs> This, this reminds me a little bit of uh, Darren Korb's soundtrack, probably like a little transistor where you have uh, rock, but a little bit of jazz mixed in there. first times I really think I've heard longing in his voice. That was really beautiful. Uh, he has some very subtle stylizations in here. I really, really dig this. We're going to listen to this section again. Uh, maybe there. On a prayer, beacon oh, okay. the light, depending on a prayer. Blazing the sun, it rose to find. Okay, so it's very interesting that on hope, it shifts down a half step there to modulate. So you feel this big shift on the word hope. I'm, I'm really curious how, where it's going to go to. Um, and 
the his stylization on roads was really one of the moments where I heard that extra longing in there. Uh, listen to it again and listen for those two things. Darkness, weak in the light, depending on a prayer. Blazing the sun, it rose to find the yeah. seed of This is uh, such a crazy shift. Um, the the tempo is slowed down here. Obviously, it feels more spacious, and there's a lot of chromatic movement, which makes it feel uh, almost like a little eerie in nature. I just want to point out here, I I feel even more firm in my understanding of the audience that's watching him, uh, essentially being the trees. He says, they are the trees, rotten pulp inside and never well. And I feel like um, that's essentially talking about people who, uh, in order to get some sort of joy in life, need needs a, a gesture to joke a, about or make fun of another person. <sighs> Even from my source Reaching for the light. Okay, we're gonna go back and listen to this section again. Because I'm really interested in how he is uh, elongating or shortening each of these words. I think um, his choice of how to express these words here is not, it's not super evident. And I think there's some sort of reason behind it. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe he's just playing with his voice. Not sure. But it, it's very interesting. We're going to go back further than this. Okay, let's go here, maybe. I want to go back even further. Okay, so right there to me, it's very interesting that he's taking the S of trees and elongating it so much. You do not need to make an S that long to be understood. He is purposefully elongating it, almost like the whispering of wind through the trees or something there. Very, very purposeful. Uh, not exactly sure why, but interesting. Okay, so rotten, he went to the N. Rotten and sing on the end there a bunch instead of rotten. Most people would choose to sing on the vowel. Instead, he's almost like playing with it as if there's like pieces maybe falling away. Uh, and then pulp inside. He also went very quickly to that LP at the end of pulp. Um, and I think he might have done the same thing inside. Let's see. Rotten pulp inside. Yeah, went to the end quick as well. So in there, he was really breaking up the sound energy a whole bunch. Uh, don't know why, again, but very deliberate and interesting choice. Never will. Roots are and then on sucking, he breaks it up again. Uh, so it almost sounds like the sound disappears, which... Uh, if you think about sucking the way that it takes things away from something else, um, 
I like that break in the sound there for a bit. It, it definitely gives you almost an audible, a visual audible or visual like visualization of that audible sound. I, I think it's very, very interesting like that. Oh, cool. Leaving from my source. Again, extended S. Huh. And why, you know, if they're writing these songs together, why did he choose the word bows? to be so elongated. What was so special about that that needed extra attention and elongating that S as well? For the Very interesting for me. this is mixed right now. I have uh, our two soloists are very distinctly in different sides of my headphones. I very much encourage everybody to listen to this on a set of headphones. Keyboard's not on. Well, I'm not gonna make you guys wait while I, I check that out. It sounded like they were in, in parallel six most of the time, just uh, not a particularly explorative harmony. Um, so I was trying to figure out what might be uh, interpreted from that, like why they lingered in this for so long. And I was looking also at some of the lights uh, as they were going across the audience. And I thought, um, is this that tired bows reaching for the light? Right, it feels like it's got a certain hopefulness to it, but it's also dragged down at the same time. And I, I wonder if that was that feeling of like wanting to reach to the light the entire time. It's interesting, he, he does a run in here on a waiting redemption, essentially. So it sounds almost Mozart or Handel-ish in that run, in that design. I was very curious to hear that element in here amongst everything else. Uh, and those words, right? It's all, it is all false pretension, Harlequin forest, awaiting redemption for a lifetime as they die alone with no one by their side. Are they forgiven? Man, there's so many interpretations, but it is all false pretension Harlequin force, I think is the one I really want to hold on to. I definitely, more and more, I feel like this Harlequin jester uh, feeling in the forest being the audience is uh, the overall theme of the song, but wow, you could take so many different interpretations of it. Um, let's go back and hear that run. Maybe here. Yeah, there. Mm -hmm. 
So in that section, you'll notice that it didn't have the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two subbeat that that earlier section had. It feels a lot more stagnant at this point, just very much in four, four. I just wanted to draw your attention to that of like, this one feels like it isn't running as much. Whoa. <laughs> These girls are really good. This part makes me think that that whole idea of a good and evil struggle inside is is uh, very on point as well. Because you hear this like demonic sound coming out of his throat saying, unfettered beast inside claiming sovereign control. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. If I had a beast like that inside of me, I probably would struggle with it. Whoa. Is it? Wow. <laughs> That piece is intimidating. <laughs> oh, interesting pause. His growl is just like the most relaxed I've heard. It's really crazy. It feels, it's like, it is terrifying and soothing at the same time. I don't know how those things can be combined, but they are combined in his growl. It's crazy. Whoa. Very jagged hits here. This kind of, um, these jagged hits here at the end, I think um, it, it feels like this part so far has been like uh, this evil voice inside emerging, right? And talks about tearing life crops asunder, useless blackened remains till pyre smoldering. And these hits feel so chaotic. I feel like maybe they're like a chaotic battle happening or just like senseless, useless, like tearing life crops asunder. Like what's the point? Like you're just destroying everything. So it has that kind of feeling. It feels very jarring to me. <laughs> it makes me cringe. <laughs> Whoa. 
This is uncomfortable. Whoa. Whoa. That ending was uh, it just for... Ugh, that's my description of that ending. It, it had this effect that was... It felt very disturbing somehow. It felt um, unsettling. Like, I really... I think all of the beats that they were hitting felt like it was somehow off. Like, it was all syncopated. And it was purposely designed to make me feel shaken up. Such... Uh, such a fascinating ending to it. And it wasn't like it was all really abrasive. Like they could have made more abrasive sounds to make a person cringe, but it was all in those accents on very carefully planned beats. And that had to be hard to keep together as a band at first, uh, but as on planned beats designed to make a person feel unsettled, it uh, has a very interesting emotional response, I think. Wow. I mean, that makes sense because what we're talking about is this uh, woods are burning, life crops are, are asunder. Uh, whoa, wow, that, that was a really cool ending. Overall, the song just has a lot of journey to it. This is one of the things that I like about progressive metal is the way that it evolves. And the song had moments where it had uh, a lot more like heaviness to it and the sound was a lot more like ripping it apart kind of feeling. And then moments of subtlety, there were moments where it felt mysterious and uplifting even at one point. Ah, it was just a fascinating array of mood that they took us through. Really fun. And then of course you have Michael's voice, which can be smooth jazz or forest monster. It was very, very exciting to hear what he can do. And it's great to hear relaxation in both elements of his voice, both in that growl sounding super open and relaxed, and also in this more jazzy tone, which feels very much not put on, just very um, unique to him. It was his own sound with everything else stripped away, just him and some beautiful, beautiful uh, twangy forward placement. I really enjoyed hearing the contrast in his voice. Oh man, uh, I had forgotten how much uh, Opeth is deserving of recognition, of analysis. This is just extraordinary music. You guys are great at making recommendations. Thank you so much to all of you that recommended this. This did win most recommended, by the way, and uh, I deservedly so. I can see the allure. I can see why it deserves so much analysis. Really cool song. If you want to keep making recommendations, please put those in the comments down below this video. Uh, and you can also come and say hello to me on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays at 8 a.m. Arizona time. That's when we have live premieres. And that's when you can watch these videos ad-free. Woohoo! Also, you can find me on Patreon. We have a really cool community. Uh, just very welcoming, warm, we play video games sometimes together. Uh, it's just a great community. I love it so much. And if you want to learn about singing or about music in general, I have courses on that at thecharismaticvoice.com. I'll see you all somewhere soon. Bye.